We're going to jump into God's Word. My name is Dave Jacobson, one of the pastors here. Always an honor to be able to open God's Word together with you. So if you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to grab that, pull it out, uh, open up to the book of Psalms, which if you're not familiar with where that is, it is a pretty large book right in the middle. Um, So you can just kind of open the middle, and uh, we are in Psalm 111. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to have uh, or give, have a Bible for you to use, and so you can find one underneath one of the seats in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, take that home with you. That is our gift to you. I always like to say you're not stealing it because we're giving it to you. So um, you can take that and... um, as you are opening up to Psalm 111, um, this, uh, you know, I had an honor yesterday, uh, kind of a special opportunity, um, sweet couple in our church, uh, Betty and Terry uh, Davis, um, they have, uh, they actually, it was last year, but um, 50 years, so they're 51 years of marriage, and so they wanted to do a vow renewal, and I had the opportunity of, of uh, being with them and, and hanging out with them and a few um, from their uh, small groups and from family uh, that came for that, but 51 years of marriage, which um, made me realize that I have a ways to go for that. This week, my wife and I, we um, are celebrating 16 years of marriage. Um, so, uh, you know, thankful for that. But, but in thinking about that, I have um, sort of a freebie, uh, just kind of, you know, a little, little piece of advice for you as we get started this morning. Um, can, I, can I give that to you? One of the things, it was a piece of advice that we got early on um, when we were, uh, I don't remember if it was in the beginning of marriage or maybe right before we were married or whatever, but, but somebody told us um, to never uh, use the words always and never uh, with each other. Um, and uh, particularly, you know, in a, in a time of a disagreement. So I don't know how um, how your uh, house works, but we, we disagree once in a while. And um, and so sometimes uh, in the heat of a moment, you might be tempted to make some statement where you say, you always blank, or you never blank, or this always happens, this never, ha- like, there's, there's sort of this, uh, this tendency to uh, sort of generalize and do that with an extreme word like always or never. But here's the problem with that, is the second you use always or never, um, it all of a sudden becomes about that word and that statement rather than the thing that you're trying to um, argue about. So this is not just for marriage, not for just for dating. This is any relationship. It could be, you know, friend, uh, relative, mom, dad, whatever it might be. Um, I would just encourage you not to use the word always and ever. Because think about it. If you say, hey, you always do this, then what comes back is, well, no, I don't, because there's that time, and there's this time, and there's that time. So now it's about like that word being correct or incorrect, and, and now you're, what so easily happens, you're not arguing about the thing that you want to argue about, you're arguing about something else. And have you ever had one of those arguments where you're like, what are we arguing about? Can we get back to that and figure out what that, what that was? And so that's kind of where uh, that comes from. So I would just caution you, that's totally free this morning, I would just caution you against using the word always and never, because it's rarely true and almost never is. But here's the thing. We have been using this word always in this series together. We've been uh, this summer going through several of the Psalms, and in it, we've been looking at what we're calling the promises of God. Uh, The series is called Promises, and we're looking at some always statements. And these things, this is a time when you can use the word always. Uh, because there is never a time when it is not true. And so we've seen that God is always good, that he is always present, that he is always our shepherd, that he is always powerful, he's always victorious. And this morning we're going to continue and we're going to see that God is always faithful. He's always faithful. You see, you and I may want to avoid those words in talking about ourselves, but when talking about the Lord... This is something that is always true. There is never a time when God is not faithful. There's never a time when he fails to do that which he said he will do. And so this is, as we've been in this series, these are layering and kind of stacking on top of each other. See, the awesome thing about looking at his faithfulness is that now all of the other things that we've looked at, all of the other promises that we've seen are sort of kind of wrapped up and and, and encompassed in this one promise that he is not changing. He is the same yesterday, today. He will be the same tomorrow. He is always faithful. And we're going to see this in Psalm 111 this morning. As I like to do, I like to kind of give us the big idea that we see this morning. This kind of is the central uh, theme that we see in this psalm, and it's this. We can trust the Lord 
because he has proven his faithfulness over and over again. Trust has been a central theme in these promises, but we can trust the Lord, what he says, what he does, who he is, why? Because he's proven himself, his faithfulness over and over again. He's demonstrated it. And what we're going to see in this psalm this morning is we're going to see his faithfulness played out in two main ways. Um, The central thing that we're seeing is his works, how he's demonstrated his faithfulness, but the two ways that he's demonstrated his faithfulness to God's people is recounting back to this deliverance that they had from Egypt, which we're going to kind of see and unpack, and then also the establishment of his law. These two ways, and and we don't often think of maybe his law as a way that he's worked, but it is. He's given us his law. It's a work of his. And so he's, he's delivered his people from Egypt, and he's established his law, and this is how he's proven and shown himself to be faithful. And here's why this is really important for us this morning. It's this, is that it comes down to, again, as you walk through, and we've said throughout that this, the situations, kind of things that we experience in life, we said are these promises are like those life preservers that you find in a, in a boat. Um, not super you know, necessary unless the boat starts kind of taking on water or there's a storm coming or, or something like that. But you want to know where it is. You want to know how it works. You want to know uh, how to get it on and, and, and make sure that you have it before the storm comes. If you wait till the boat is already taking on water, you've waited too long. In the same way, we want to look at these promises now. Whatever situation you might be in, there's going to be a time, and maybe you're in it right now, when you need to know who God is, how he's shown himself to be, and these promises that you can rest in. His faithfulness is one of these promises. And so that's where we're going today. We're going to see it all from Psalm 111. Let me pray and ask that God would teach us and lead us now as we open his word together. Uh, Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the faithfulness that we see demonstrated throughout its pages. And God, the way that you've demonstrated that same faithfulness in our lives now. Even as we've sung and declared through song this morning of your faithfulness, God, we want to be reminded afresh right now. And so I pray, Lord, that you will teach us, that you will give us a confidence, an expectation, God, a hope in in you and what you've said and the way that you're working and what you're doing. And Lord, that you would lead us in that even now. Uh, We ask that you will teach us through your word in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. Psalm 111, hopefully you're there. I want to read the first um, several verses, and then we're going to kind of walk our way uh, through it. And I apologize, I usually have it up on the screen. Today, um, it is not. Um, and so that was my, <laughs> my fault, long week, and uh, just, just kind of missed it there. So um, hopefully you've got a copy of Scripture in front of you. Psalm 111, beginning in verse 1, it says this, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright, in the congregation, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nation the works of his hands are faithful and just. Uh, the first way that we see God's faithfulness demonstrated to us over and over, the way that he's proven it to us is this, is in the things that he does. The Lord is faithful in what he does. And this psalm is recounting the way that he has worked, the things that he has done. And it sort of frames it, if we can go back to verse 1 and understand kind of the framing of what the psalmist is trying to do here, this first verse, uh, rather the first line, this praise the Lord sort of stands apart and unique from the rest of the psalm. Um, it is uh, sort of the title, it's kind of the, the, uh, the, the direction piece for it, but it says praise the Lord, it kind of gives the tone for uh, the entire psalm. And praise is the right response to an almighty God. Praise is the right response to an almighty God. Why? Well, because of who God is and what he's done, he is worthy of our praise. And we do. We we praise the things that we appreciate. We praise the things that we um, are impressed with. Um, We uh, uh, talk about and and point to and celebrate uh, things all the time. 
How much more so is our Lord deserving of that? Praise the Lord. And this is the heart of the psalmist. He says there, he says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and in the congregation. So right off the bat, we see sort of the direction, the tone of the psalm, but also the presence and kind of the place the psalm exists. See, this is a psalm that is for the company of the congregation. It's for all of God's people together. And this is a helpful point for us to recognize and understand as we look at this this morning, is that praise, when you and I uh, acknowledge and sing and point to the things that God has done, that is best done in the company of other believers, in the congregation of God's people. It is done, it is to be done in the company of the congregation. Um, This is why we gather it says, I will give thanks to the Lord in my whole heart, with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. See, you and I tend to have what I think we can call like praise amnesia. <laughs> we often will forget all of the reasons that we have to praise God for who he is and all the things that he has done. But something about the gathering of God's people, being together in this place and sort of setting aside the first part of our week, the first uh, sort of hours of our week together, we are reminded in this place and in this, the company of believers of God's faithfulness. And this is what the church is called to do. This is central to who we are. See, we are called to gather for worship of God together. And that is why this year and a half plus, this has been tested, right? Time and time again, we've had to sort of adapt and figure out new ways. There was a time when we couldn't meet physically together at all. And so we kind of took everything online and we gathered uh, digitally, so to speak. And then slowly we were able to start begin coming back together more and more kind of together. Um, Today, uh, I think a lot of people are sort of enjoying uh, the great outdoors in kind of a way. And so that's kind of what we see in summer, get that, understand we've all been uh, kind of locked down, but I anticipate what we're going to see as we approach fall is more and more people ready, willing, able to be together. Why? Because when we're together, it reminds us afresh of God's faithfulness in the way that he has worked. It is the place that he has called us to. That is why we've said before, I mean, if you can't, make it a priority of being together, but if you can't, that's why we've provided the opportunity and the way to be able to gather from afar online. And far better than just watching a YouTube video of the service later is to gather together at the same time with the people interacting together and and, and being able to worship in this way together. Why? Well, one of the primary purposes that we gather is this, is to confess God and who he is. This is what the psalm is doing. It says in verse 2, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. This is why we gather. And I got to tell you, as a pastor and one of the leaders of this church, it really kind of takes um, some, uh, what could be some unnecessary pressure off of me. You see, I think so many times we maybe um, think that the, the job of the service, and it's so much become about this, is to uh, create some sort of uh, experience uh, that wows and impresses each week that, that people come and have uh, sort of their world uh, rocked or have, you know, it's like, man, I'm charged up and ready to go. And even in, you know, trying to preach God's word, kind of coming up with something creative and fresh every week and sort of sending people off. And so it's so encouraging to know that it's not my job to come up with some sort of uh, spiritual TED talk each week that's going to kind of fuel your week and, and the days ahead. Rather, what I'm trying to do is to sort of get out of the way if I can and just point to what God has perfectly said in his word and the way that he's perfectly worked and that all of our songs and all of the parts of our service, that it's not so much about this thing that we're creating, rather that we're pointing toward God, worshiping God, giving glory to God, being reminded of what he said and who he is and what he's done, that we would be enamored and and find glory in God himself. That is why we gather. We want to confess God together. And that's super helpful and informative to us as we gather in this way. I don't know if you think about if we were to kind of pull the room, like, why'd you come to church today? Why are you here? Why are you logged on? I would say this, one of the primary reasons that we are here is to confess who God is, what he's done, and to worship him in light of those truths. And so this psalm for us is super helpful because it speaks to and points to the things that he's done. We see that he's faithful in what he does 
And this is kind of a unique psalm because this isn't a psalm to God. This is actually a psalm about God. You see it there? All the, the sort of uh, tenses of the words and, and sort of the um, parts of speech that are used and, and all of that is not uh, speaking to God in sort of uh, second person, but, but sort of third person speaking about God to the congregation. And so this is a song for the church. This is a song for God's people. And part of this praise process and what is being modeled here is to rehearse the story of God's works. And that's what we see there in verse 2. It says, great are the works of the Lord, studied, studied by all who delight in them. I don't know if you think about this, but do you study, do you meditate, do you think about the things that God has done as part of your praise to him? You see, this psalm is doing and modeling for us just that. I said at the beginning that praise the Lord sort of stands unique. The reason that that stands unique is because the whole rest of the psalm, every line after it is actually an acrostic. Um, And that's a fancy way of saying that each line begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So we miss this in our English translation, right? But each new line is a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so I think there's 23 uh, different lines, and it's all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so each one, it kind of goes through. And if it was in English, it'd be A, B, C, D, right? And so that's how this sort of goes. And it's, it's all thematic around the works of the Lord, recounting what he has done, rehearsing the story of God's works. Particularly, four, four through six point to major milestones. We can call these kind of big rocks in Israel's history and why they're praising him for what he's done. Verse 4, the first part, it says this, he's caused his wondrous works to be remembered. Now, there's a lot that we could kind of unpack in this. Some of the language that's used is sort of only ever used in some other places. But one of the other places that it's used is in conjunction, this wondrous works to be remembered is used in conjunction with Passover. See, for God's people, Passover was a very special thing that they remembered each year. If you don't know what Passover was, Passover was uh, God's people, the Israelites, were put into slavery, they were put into captivity, they were in Egypt, and for hundreds of years, for generations, calling out to the Lord, asking Him to free them and to work on their behalf and to release them from slavery. And He finally uh, raised up, responded to, raised up this man Moses, who came before Pharaoh, and through these wondrous works, right, His plagues that God sent He got Pharaoh's attention and ultimately to the last one, which was uh, the angel of death coming, taking the firstborn of every house in the city, in that place that didn't have the blood of the lamb above it. So it was called Passover because the Spirit of the Lord passed over the homes. And as a result of that, they were freed and they were released and God redeemed. He saved his people. They were released from slavery. Now, why I think this this language and sort of where this is, Psalm 111 and 112 are kind of tied together. Um, uh, We're going to actually unpack Psalm 112 next week. But then Psalm 113 through 118 are actually all about Passover and God's redemption for his people. And so I think this is what he's pointing to in this. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered, things like Passover that point to this exodus of God's people. This was a major milestone, a major piece that they were reciting and remembering. It goes on in verse 4. It says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. That language is also uh, seen in another very specific spot. That language around gracious and merciful, we see a God on Mount Sinai when he met with Moses. See, God led God's, uh, uh, his people out of slavery, out of captivity. He led them to this mountain. He led Moses up on the mountain. He was giving to Moses the very law that was going to govern and lead his people. While he was there, the people down below, uh, like I said, praise amnesia, sort of spiritual amnesia, they were down below. What they did is they convinced Aaron, sort of second in, in command, to gather all of the jewelry, all of the fine metals, and, and take them all together, melt them down, and they made them into a golden calf and began to worship the calf. And so Moses was meeting with the Lord, receiving the instruction for God's people. He comes down and he finds God's people, like newly saved, newly redeemed, just out of captivity, now worshiping this image, this golden calf. And God was gracious and merciful in that moment. 
See, it could have all been over. He could have sent them back. He could have done whatever he wanted. But what did he do? He gave them a new law, a new commandment all over again. And he continued to show his faithfulness to them. And so this is recounting and saying, listen, the Lord is gracious and merciful. Verse 5 points to another. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. When in Israel's history did they get food provided for them? The most prominent place certainly is as they then continued on and wandered in the wilderness for many years. They were hungry, so hungry, in fact, they were wishing that they were back in Egypt. They're like, man, at least in Egypt we had, we had meals and we weren't, we weren't hungry, we weren't starving. Has God led us out here to starve us? He didn't, certainly. Instead, he provided food. And so every morning they woke up to this sort of bread-type substance on the floor. They called it manna, which means what is it? They didn't even know. They're like, I don't know what this is, but it keeps me going. They were eating that. They provided, God provided quail for them. And they had food the entire time provided solely from the Lord. Every day, except for Sabbath, which they were able to gather double the day before, he provided food for those who feared him, and he remembered his covenant before them, another milestone for the people of God. In verse 6, he has shown his power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. He wasn't, they weren't wandering for no purpose. They were wandering ultimately being led to the place that God had provided for him. He had some nations set aside for them. He had a very special piece of land that he was set aside and he was giving to them. The problem is this was occupied by all sorts of other peoples. And so he led his people there. And then by his power, he drove the people out. He gave them victory in taking that land that he had given them. And so he had this inheritance of the nations for his people. He gave them the land that they were in. You see, what this psalm is doing is it is doing just this. It is a way that we can study and delight in the works of God. These were the milestones of the way that God was working. And in each of those, it reminded them that the people, reminded the people of Israel to remember that they were redeemed, they were set free, there was an exodus, and to remember that God has worked in the past and that he's still working now. Because he let them out, he was going to provide for them. He was still gracious, still merciful. Even when they betrayed him and began to worship others, he still was faithful and forgave and called them back to himself. We see that he never leads to the wilderness without sustaining through the journey. And he blessed the people through the land, eventually blessing the whole world through the people, through his covenant. He's gone before them. He showed his power these are the milestones that they point to. And you see, if we're not careful, what we need to do is we need to remember and, and recognize all the good things that God has given and that he has done. And God, in this psalm, proves or stands as a way to remind the people so that they would celebrate and worship God for all the things that he has done. Now, um, to kind of illustrate, I think when we miss the boat on this, is, uh, you know, if you've ever... Um, those of you that are parents or if you've uh, been at maybe a birthday party where like you've given a gift or you've seen a gift given and it kind of missed the mark. Has anyone you know, experienced that? You sort of open it up and you're like, ooh, that was not what they were expecting. And sometimes, you know, most kids will just so, sort of say it like, I didn't want that or that's not the right color or whatever, you know. And, and not, not all the time, right? You know, so that's, that certainly happened in, in our house. Actually, there was a recent birthday that had, uh, we were cleaning up some stuff this week and found one of the most epic birthday lists that ever been created by one of my kids. We actually saved it because it was so good. I can't wait to show it. Um, it's Ava's list. Can't wait to show it to her someday. Um, there was nothing short of probably 57 items on this list. Now, she knows she's not getting 57 things for birthday, like maybe one or two, uh, depending on the size, if they're all little things, you know, maybe a couple more. We'll see. But uh, this was a list, 57 items, all color-coded, okay? So there was, a, there was like different highlighter marks, and then there was a key at the top. And so bright yellow was like the like, do not miss these things. Like this is like must, must get items. And then after that, there was like 10 or 12 other things um, that were also highlighted. Like these are the top ones. And then there was a bunch that weren't highlighted. Basically, they're like, yeah, if you just have, you know, more cash laying around that you just want to, you know, drop on me, dad, um, then this is, this is where you should spend that money. And I was asking her about this list this week. I'm like, honey, where did you come up with all these things? She's like, 
you know, we don't, um, we kind of keep our devices pretty, pretty locked down. The kids don't have kind of free access to all of that. But uh, we do let them sometimes um, go on Amazon or Target or something if they're like looking for a birthday present for their uh, siblings or, you know, around Christmas time or whatever. So apparently she had access to Amazon and kind of found some list that was like top gifts for 10 year olds. And, and she's like, I just kind of put everything on that list, like on, <laughs> on that. It all looked good to me. You know, she wanted all of it, right? And so she went into this birthday with major expectations. There's 57 things on this list. Like, how many presents am I going to get? What is it going to be? All of that. For sure, going into that, destined to be let down in that. And if you've ever been in that seat as a parent, and you've given, and you want, and you're like, man, I think they're going to love this, and then they open, and it doesn't, what a sinking feeling that is. And, 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 and this, like, I mean, there's all sorts of waves of emotion. Like, okay, you... <laughs> Are you being ungrateful? Like, how do you know? Like, trying to teach all of this stuff. But how much more so, (laughs) how much more so does our Heavenly Father look down on us as His children, His sons, His daughters, and all the good things that He's done for us, all the ways that He's worked? And how many times do we, and I think it's an apt comparison, like a grumpy child, respond, God, it's not good enough. I want more. Or it's the wrong color or you didn't get the right brand, or that's what I wanted last year, or whatever, and we forget the things that God has done. See, the reason that we want to study and be delighted in the works of God is it guards us against having an improper spirit, an improper attitude toward the Lord. See, what we're called to is praise. That's why it says, like, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord in the whole company, in the whole, with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in Him. We are called to praise. If we don't remember, we will forget to praise. And here's what I think we do instead. We see these things throughout Scripture. I just kind of put together a list of when we forget what God has done. This is what often comes out instead. I think one thing that comes out is this. It's grumbling. We tend to grumble. If I was to kind of define grumbling uh, in this context, it would be complaining about what needs to be fixed. See, God's people, so many times, the description that we have of them as they wandered through was grumbling. It was complaining about all the things that weren't right, that needed to be fixed. When we forget what God has done, it might not come out as grumbling, but maybe it comes out as this, as a critical spirit. This is focusing on what needs to be fixed. Not on what we have, not what's going well, not the way that God's worked, but what needs attention, what needs to be fixed. And so many times our spirit can be what we would call critical, right? Where it's all our energy, all our attention on those negative things, the things that aren't quite the way that we'd want them to be. Or if we forget what God's done, we might end find ourselves in a place of this, worry. This would be dwelling on what might need to be fixed, right? We said worry is a future thing. It's about the things that have yet to occur, which has not yet happened. And so that's a dwelling on what might need to be fixed someday. We don't even know yet, so we worry. Or if we forget what God has done in the past, we might be moved toward even as far as despair. And this would be thinking that it will never be fixed. That it will never get better. That there is no hope. If we forget what God has done in the past, we might find ourselves in a place of despair. Or maybe it's not one of those. Maybe it's a little more subtle, and it would just be what we could call discontentment. And that is forgetting what God has already fixed. We're discontent with what he's done in the past. It's not enough. Or maybe it's just skepticism, doubting what God has promised he will fix. He's made some promises about what he's going to do and how he's going to address these things, and maybe we're just skeptical about that, and we doubt that he actually will. You see, when we understand, when we recognize and praise God for all the ways that he has already worked, it actually changes the way that we are seen to those around us in the world. Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says this. It says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless, innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. How do we do things without grumbling and without disputing, without complaining? 
It's been praising God for all the things that he has done. And that, in turn, we shine as lights in the dark world. Among this twisted generation, people will see the glory of God in the praise of his people. And to be sure, verse 7 sums it all up and says this, the works of his hand are faithful and just. The works of his hands are faithful and just. God is faithful and he's righteous in everything that he does. And so what this is trying to get us to, to the place of, what the psalm is calling us to is more than, <laughs> more than just trying to be positive, right? Having like a, a positive outlook on the situations that we find ourselves in, right? Because sometimes it's not, it's not just about that. Well, I just need to you know, have a better, better attitude about it. My mom used to tell me all the time, you can't change your circumstances, but you can change your attitude, It's actually really good advice. I find myself using that with my kids all the time. But it's not just about trying to have a positive attitude. The thing that transforms our attitude, the thing that transforms our view of the situation is remembering this, that God is faithful in what he does. And what we need to do is we need to rehearse the gospel story in our life. You see, in the same way that God has worked in his people If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have been redeemed by the work of Jesus, you have the same story to tell. As believers, we can all point to these major milestones, these marks which God has done as sons and daughters of God. This is true of every believer, every follower of Jesus. Romans chapter 5, 1 through 11, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it kind of points to some of these milestones. It says in verse 6, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. There are so many passages just chock full of this where it points to and shows the way that the gospel has worked in our lives. And here's the truth that we have to remember. Because of God's character, we can know this, that the way that he has acted in the past will show us how he will act in the future. And so we can be encouraged, we can be shaped and transformed by seeing God's faithfulness to his people throughout the generations We see it in both the Old Testament and the New. We see the way that he worked in the church and in those that he called to himself. But more than that, we see the way that he's still working today. You see, God is just as committed to his covenant with his people today as he was when he first said it and gave it to his people. His relationship with us is not not based on our acting toward him. Rather, it's based on his faithfulness to us. And so if we respond to him, if we receive that which he's freely given to us, it's nothing that we earn, nothing that we deserve, nothing that we have somehow achieved. Rather, he has done all of it. And I wonder, are we studying, as it says in verse 2, by all who delight in them, studying the great works of the Lord in our life? You know, this would be a great way to apply this even this week, you know, that we would think about, that we would remember the way that God has worked in our lives. I think this happens, certainly, on an individual level. I wonder, do you have some milestones that you can point to in your life, maybe some key things, those big rocks, just like the Israelite people had. They remembered the Exodus. They remembered uh, the the grace of God when they uh, made that idol. They remembered God's faithfulness through the manna and through the quail. They remembered God's faithfulness in giving them the nations and leading them to the, the land. I wonder if you can... Make a similar list in your life. I remember when God did this. I remember when he was faithful in this way. I remember when he worked in this way. I remember when I saw his hand present here. See, I think it's so good for us to have maybe five, six things that we can point to and and know and remember the way that God has worked in the past in our lives. Why? Because it reminds us that he will be faithful in the future. See, God is faithful in the things that he does. One exercise that I use in counseling, um, both with couples and individuals, I think it's, it's a great exercise to kind of go through, but I'll have people sort of recount the story of their life 
And so those that are younger, the, the list is sort of a little bit like shorter. <laughs> those that have a few more years, the list is quite long. Um, but just starting from like early memories, uh, from like as early as you can remember, um, kind of tracking and graphing like positive and negative experiences. And so was that a good time? Do you remember, is that, was that joyful or was that difficult? Was that painful? And sort of on a scale of like, one, like five to negative five, kind of where, where these things, and so what, what, what results is sort of this kind of, you know, little jagged graph and there's good times and there's hard times and, and you know, there's, there's fond memories and there's difficult memories and all of that and sort of tracking through. So going through first grade, second grade, third grade, through high school, you know, through college or, or after or whatever, you know, kind of in that. And, and then... Once they've done that, sort of tracked what it's then, what really is uh, powerful is I'll bust out some crayons or some colored pencils, and I say, well, let's now kind of color code this thing, and let's see what God has revealed about himself through these situations. And it doesn't matter if it's a good time or a bad time, God is teaching certain things in those. So it's amazing, because as they go through, they see maybe some of the most painful, difficult, the negative five memories that they have, they can see that God was faithful through those seasons. Or maybe they saw the people of God, the community of God, stepping up and being a real source of encouragement and blessing, and they see um, the relationships that God provided through that. Or maybe they're reminded of God's love and His grace in these moments, or they see some of these things. See, the amazing thing is you step back from the story of what God's done in your life, and you can see and be reminded of the way that God has worked. I would encourage you to do something to that end. Maybe it's not the color-coded graph and the whole thing. If you're into that, that's fine. I'll even give you the sheet if you want. I've got a kind of a, a sheet that, um, that sort of has that. But I would encourage you at the very least to do this, to come up with what are those big things that you would point to? How has God worked? Why? Because there is blessing that comes from those who study the great works of the Lord and delight in them. It's a meditation and a delight on God's faithfulness in the past, and it brings us to this place that we would recognize and see the way that he's working now and the way that he will work going forward. I think you can play the same thing out in your family, parents, moms, dads. What are the stories, what are the things, the milestones that you would point to in your family that you would say, maybe together as a couple or maybe with your kids, like, hey, God has been faithful. This. Remember when we moved here and this happened? Or remember when God provided this and, and, and we didn't think it? And these are the stories that you can tell in your family and be reminded of God's faithfulness in that way. We certainly have them together corporately as a church. There are so many things that we could kind of point to and see, and I try and, I try and share those when I see them. I mean, there's little things that started when, it was just, when the church was just kind of getting going, right? And there was just a handful of people. And, and uh, I remember, um, you know, the way that God worked one time, we were getting ready to buy the equipment that we needed for the, the high school we were going to meet in. It was all of our portable equipment, trailers and cases and all this kind of crazy stuff. And the day that we were, um, I was supposed to make this phone call to sort of finalize the order of all of our stuff, I had this kind of odd lunch on my calendar. It was another pastor in town. I really didn't have time for this lunch. And uh, Bree, even, I remember Bree even asking me, like, why are you meeting with him? Like, not that she was against it, but it was just like, it was so busy. And it was like, do you really need this right now? Is this the time uh, that you need <laughs> to do this? And I was like, I don't know. I just feel like I, feel like I need to, to meet with him. And, and um, you know, it's, it's fine. We'll, we'll kind of make it work. And, and um, it was just kind of a crazy week. Well, at that lunch, this pastor starts sharing. He's like, um, that they had been portable and they still had all sorts of portable equipment. They had trailers, they had cases, they had like half the stuff that we were getting ready to purchase. And I was like, God, you are so good. Only you can orchestrate that. Like I was going to leave that meeting and go and make the phone call and order the rest of it. And, and, and so like a good trans church planner, I asked, well, would you give that all to us? Can we have that for free? And he's like, well, I don't know if we can do that, but we can sell it to you, you know, really affordable. And it did. It saved us a ton and we were able to get everything that we needed. I mean, God provided miraculously in that moment. And I'm telling you, our core group at that time, and those of you that were in the core group and there at that time, you remember what an encouragement and how much wind was in our sails from that. It's like, look at how God has worked miraculously in this moment. And there are story after story after story, different people that were like encounters that happened uh, with people or different you know, opportunities in this and all these things. You know, one of the things I point to all the time is this location that we're meeting. I know it's just a building. But man, I am so thankful every time we walk through the doors. I hope we never get tired of telling the story of the way that God preserved this building and allowed us to move in here and have a place to meet. Could you imagine what this year and a half would have looked like 
through COVID, they're still not letting, like Memorial High School is still not open. We would not be there in the high school. Uh, we would have been broadcasting out of our living room. It would have created all sorts of drama in the Jacobson household. That would not have worked. I'm just telling you, it, just, it wouldn't have worked. I don't know what we would have done, but God was so good and so gracious, and he gave us this place to meet. And there are so many stories, so many things, so many encounters that we can talk about and point to and say, and I would love to just capture some of these, that we would have some of these stories that we can say, look, God was faithful to us then. He's going to be faithful to us now. You see, when we study, when we meditate, when we delight in the way that God has worked, it shapes the way that we see him now. And I hope that you have those things. And I would encourage you, even on a much smaller level, certainly, yes, do the big things, but even on the small ways, as your day wraps up, Maybe you can kind of make this part of your practice if you don't do this already as you're going to bed or kind of wrapping up for the day. Would you spend some time in prayer and just ask God, God, where did you work today? That you would bring before him the things that you saw him work in. God, thank you for the way that you worked in this. God, thank you for the joy that you brought me in this. Would we take time, would we take a moment to pause and to recognize and to see the way that God is and has worked even in the small things throughout each and every day? This would be an amazing way to end our days together, recognizing, studying, delighting in the works of the Lord, even in these smaller works. We take stock, we take inventory in the way that God has worked because he is faithful in what he does. Not just that, not just that, but one of the ways that he works is in his word. And so we also see that God is faithful in what he says. He's faithful in what he says, and he's said it through his word. Let's look at it in verse 7. It says, The works of his hand are faithful and just. All of his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have good understanding. And his praise endures forever. You see, Psalm 111 is actually pretty unique in the way that it kind of takes God's word and it ties it together with his working in the exodus of God's people, the deliverance from Egypt. You don't really see that a ton of places, but you kind of see this this merging of the two. And why? Why is it so powerful? Well, God uh, led his people out of Egypt, out of captivity, right? Out of slavery. Now he's got this brand new nation. And how are they to live? How are they to govern themselves? How are they to conduct themselves among the people? Well, he's like, this is how, this is my word. And so God is being good and gracious to his people in giving his word. It was one of his works as well. And there's some things, the places that we can point to and see why God's word is faithful and, and what God's word is. And, and I would just say this, like just a couple, a couple things with this that we see right here. Uh, verse seven, it says that all his precepts are trustworthy And this is what we can know about God's word, is that God's word can be trusted. Do you know that God's word can be trusted? His precepts, these are his instructions, his teachings, the the direction that he's given us in his word. Well, they are all trustworthy. All of his precepts are trustworthy. And I don't know that we, uh, if we're not careful, I think we can forget this. You see, sometimes I think it's easy for the Word of God to feel like a burden, right? Like it's, it's a rule, a bunch of rules. It's, it's a chore in our day. If we're honest, it's like, man, I, I, don't, I don't read it quite like I should, or I, you know, I don't always do everything that it calls me to, or sometimes it's kind of confusing, and I don't know if I'm really up for doing the work and, and trying to figure it out. But listen, the Word of God is not a burden. One commentator says that it's given so the people of God might reflect the nature of their king in their national existence. When God first gave his word to his people, it was this calling out of his people, his nation, this nation of Israel, and how he wanted them to respond. He's continued to build on that, and we've seen his word. And so this is still a calling for his people to live and to reflect the nature of their king, that they would know and understand who their king is, and they would be able to live in light of that truth. And I think so many times we forget just the power and the authority that the Bible God's word is to have in our life. This week, I had a kind of interesting interaction. Someone reached out to us about the church and kind of asked some questions about who we are and what we believe. And, and based on the questions, I could tell that they were going to disagree with what I was about to say. And so I prayed over it um, and uh, tried to be as kind and gracious. And it's always hard, right? They don't know me. 
And um, I would much rather have that uh, conversation over coffee or, um, you know, but they emailed, and so I wanted to just be kind and email back. And so I kind of, you know, as best I could, kind of politely um, stated, hey, this is who we are, and this is what God's Word teaches, and so we hold to the Word of God. And, and so, um, you know, we, uh, we do that with grace, we do that with kindness, but, but God is, is pretty clear on some of these things. And the pushback that came back as a response was, well, you can kind of take the Bible and make it say whatever you want it to say. And that, I think, for many, and maybe this is the camp you might fall into, I don't, I don't know what you think of or, or the way that you see God's Word, but this is not malleable. This cannot be shifted and changed. This is not subjective to whatever church you're in or whatever uh, kind of congregation you're a part of, and this is just something that can kind of transform and kind of be formed into whatever. This is absolute. God has given it, and He is clear in this. And so when we see, when we come across this and we understand that, that, that the works of his hands are faithful and just, all of his precepts are trustworthy. He has clearly stated everything that he would have us know in a way that we can comprehend and understand it. And so it is not subjective to men. It is not to be transformed by uh, women. It is not uh, something that's to be taken by us and, and shifted into whatever we would have it be. And so I said to him, I said, listen, this is what the Word of God teaches. And so we submit to it. We place ourselves under the authority of God's Word. And if God says it, then we want to follow it. And so with grace and with love and with kindness, I would just say to you that, you know, I would encourage you to conform to the teachings of God's Word. He is God, and He has said it. And may we we conform our thinking and our understanding to that. You see, God's Word can be trusted. God's word is clear. And certainly, let's be clear, there are some parts in there that we're like, what does that mean? How do do we understand that? But those are minor peripheral issues. All of the central things, everything that God wants us to know, he has said with utmost clarity, okay? There is so much that we can focus on, understand, know some of these other parts or pieces. And honestly, the more you dig into it, the more you understand, the more you study it, you see that it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. God's Spirit is leading. His Word is not confusing. It is all there. The more you dig into it, you're going to see this, that God's Word can be trusted. The other awesome truth around God's Word is this, is that God's Word lasts forever. It says there in verse 8 that they are established, his precepts referring to there, they are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. You see that there is an eternality to the works and to the words of God. His righteousness endures forever. We see that in verse 3. Verse 4, it's to be remembered. He is to be remembered. Verse 5, he remembers his covenant forever. Verse 8, established forever and ever. Verse 10, praise endures forever. Because God is eternal, his word and his decrees and all that will never pass away. Everything that he has stated will be true for all of time. And through him and his character and his power, it allows him to be faithful through his word. And I think that is one of the powerful things about God's word is because God is eternal, his word is eternal. And there is a direct correlation between that. Because God is eternal and has power, he can be faithful. Because of his eternality and because of his power, God's word is faithful. It's true. It's right. And I and you, you and me, we are not like that, right? We're limited in our eternality in terms of we have a start. We have a limited scope on what we understand and know. We don't know what comes next. None of us know what's happening tomorrow. Uh, We might have some plans, but that's all that they are. Until they happen, we have very little control over those things. We have limited scope. God is not like that. He sees and knows all things for all time, and so he can work in all of those things. And his word, it lasts forever. It's true for all of time. And so it does not change with the generations. It does not shift with the rising and falling of nations. It lasts forever. And part of that is because God's word is rooted in his character. You see this, that he sent his redemption to his people, his commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. You see his character, his holiness and awesomeness. It's might and power, it's otherness, it's beyond anything that we can understand or comprehend in our limited understanding. He is beyond us, holy and awesome is his name. 
And what we understand and know is this, is that what has happened in the past and the way that God has worked is a result of because who he, who he is. You see, God chose this people. God chose to make man and woman. He chose to redeem, God's, or redeem his people through the working of his son. He chose to show grace and show mercy through the power of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus. And so he has done this in the past. Why? Because of who he is. And so we know that he will continue to work in the future because of who he is. And so God's word is faithful in what he says. It's rooted in his character. And we have to not miss this. All of this leads us to this, is that God's word leads us to action. God's word leads us to action. It says here that the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. You see, God's word should lead us to an application. One of the things we like to say around here is we're not hurting for a lack of information. We're hurting for a lack of application. If we were to respond to and put into application all the things that he's already said to us, that we already know, then we would have plenty to get after today, right? But here's the thing is that God has worked so mightily and so powerfully in the past that when we act, when we put into action the word of God, we're responding to his greatness and to his goodness in our life. And this is a mark of spiritual maturity. This is a mark of spiritual growth in your life. Do you know this, that a mark of spiritual maturity and growth is a greater delight in the obedience to God's word. If you are growing in your delight to obey God's word, That is a sign, a symbol that God is actively at work in your life. I remember there's plenty of things that were a burden or a drag or why is it this way or why is it that? And now I find as a delight to be able to follow. Hopefully you can see the same. You can point to things that may used to be difficult or hard, but now you've seen the way God's worked and he's brought you to a place that no, it is a delight to obey and to respond to God in this way. This is how God's word leads us. It changes, it transforms, it shapes us into who we are. All of this leads us back to, and we're reminded of where we started. We said this, that we can trust. We can trust the Lord because he's proven his faithfulness to us over and over again. Would this be the central action that God's faithfulness draws us to today? Would you have, in whatever situation you find yourself in, a great sense of trust that God is present and working in it? Would God's word, would his precepts, would his promises, would his telling of his character, would this bring you to a place that you are resulting in an obedient trust in him and who he is and what he's doing, even if you don't understand it, even if you're disappointed with where he seems to be taking you or how he seems to be doing it, would we have this trust and a confidence that God is good and he is always working and he is always faithful And in that, we can rest and trust in him. Because of what he's done in the past, we can trust that he will be faithful now and he will be faithful in what is yet to come. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. God, your steadfastness, your enduring presence in all things and in our lives. And God, I ask that you will continue to draw us into a place, God, bring us to a place of greater trust, of greater obedience, God, of greater praise of who you are, that we would see and respond to the way that you've worked. And God, so many times I know I'm guilty of it where I forget, God, I forget to, um, God, give praise to the way that you've worked in the past. I doubt the way that you're going to work in the future. Lord, would that not be said of us? Help us to see clearly, God, the way that you have worked and the way that you are working now. God, help us to remember your faithfulness in the past that we would count on and look to your faithfulness in the future. God, your word has said it time and time and time again. You are faithful. Everything you've said will come to pass. God, you are always faithful. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember this and to count on this and to live in light of this. God, thank you that we can trust you and that you are good and that you are
you are working. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.